Welcome to our latest video on the topic of halogenoalkanes, understanding nucleophilic substitution reactions. This video is suitable for AS and A-level students. By the end of this video lesson, you should be able to explain the factors that determine the reactivity of halogenoalkanes and be aware that halogenoalkanes undergo nucleophilic substitution reactions with hydroxide and cyanide ions. You should also be able to write chemical equations and draw reaction mechanisms to describe the nucleophilic substitution reactions and be able to name the products that form in these reactions. And finally, you should be able to explain why aromatic halogeno compounds such as chlorobenzene are resistant to undergoing nucleophilic substitution reactions. Now in this video we're going to look at the main type of reactions that halogenoalkanes undergo. Now halogenoalkanes undergo nucleophilic substitution reactions and a substitution reaction is a reaction where reactant atoms swap or rearrange to form products and these type of reactions are nucleophilic substitution reactions because there is an attack on the halogenoalkane by a nucleophile which displaces the halogen atom as a halide. Now a nucleophile is an electron pair donator and examples of nucleophiles include hydroxide ions and cyanide ions. And on this slide we can see the general mechanism or reaction summary for nucleophilic substitution. So the Y minus here represents the electron pair donator, the nucleophile, and a pair of electrons will move from the nucleophile towards the delta plus carbon of the halogenoalkane. Now the carbon is delta plus because in a halogenoalkane the carbon is next to a halogen which is more electronegative than carbon and that's why a dipole exists delta plus on the carbon and delta minus on the halogen. Now when a pair of electrons moves towards the delta plus carbon, this causes the carbon halogen bond to break and therefore I represent the movement of electrons towards the delta plus carbon with a double headed arrow and when the carbon halogen bond breaks we also represent this with movement of two electrons onto the halogen atom so the bond breaks and I draw a double headed arrow from the middle of the carbon halogen bond to the halogen atom. Now the halogen atom here is represented by the symbol X. So when the carbon halogen bond breaks, a pair of electrons moves onto the halogen atom to form a halide ion X minus. Now when the nucleophile attacks the delta plus carbon, a dative or coordinate bond forms between the nucleophile and the carbon. Now the result of this mechanism is that the nucleophile swaps places with the halogen atom and a substitution reaction takes place. Now in this video we're going to look at two examples of nucleophilic substitution reactions. We're going to look at hydrolysis of a halogenoalkane where the halogenoalkane reacts with OH- ions and we're also going to look at reaction of halogenoalkanes with a cyanide ion. Now the reactivity of halogenoalkanes depends on two competing factors. The first is the polarity of the carbon-halogen bond and the second is the bond energy of the carbon-halogen bond. In other words, how much energy is needed to break this bond. Because if we look at the reaction summary, the reason that the nucleophile attacks the halogenoalkane in the first place is because it's attracted to the delta plus carbon on the halogenoalkane. And how positive that delta plus carbon is depends on the halogen it's next to. It depends on the polarity of the carbon-halogen bond because the reason that the carbon is delta plus is because there's a dipole between the carbon and the halogen. And the more electronegative that halogen is, the more delta minus that halogen is and the more delta plus the carbon is. 
So the polarity of the carbon-halogen bond is going to be one factor that's going to influence the reactivity of halogen alkanes. Now the second factor that influences the reactivity of halogen alkanes is the bond strength. Now the reason that bond strength is important is because a key step in this reaction mechanism is the breaking of the carbon-halogen bond. Now the easier the carbon-halogen bond breaks, the more reactive you would expect the halogen alkane to be. So now let's look at these two factors in a little more detail. So let's start with the polarity factor. The reason that the nucleophile attacks the halogen alkane is because the carbon has a delta plus charge on it. And this is caused by the carbon being next to a halogen that is more electronegative than the carbon. Now the more electronegative the halogen is, the bigger the dipole between the carbon and the halogen, and the more positive the carbon atom is, the more delta plus the carbon is. Now remember, the nucleophile attacks the halogen alkane because it's attracted to this delta plus charge on the carbon. So therefore you would expect that fluoroalkanes would react more readily than chloro, bromo and iodo alkanes. Now you might expect this to be true however fluoroalkanes are actually the least reactive halogen alkanes. So therefore although polarity is a factor because without a polar bond and without a delta plus carbon the nucleophile would not attack the halogen alkane the very fact that the most polar halogen alkane is the least reactive halogen alkane shows that polarity is not the dominant factor here it's a factor but it's not the most important factor now the most important factor governing the reactions of halogen alkanes is bond strength. Now for nucleophilic substitution to take place the carbon halogen bond must break and it's logical to assume that the easier the carbon halogen bond breaks the more readily nucleophilic substitution will take place. Now this table shows the bond strength of the carbon-halogen bonds. And you can see from this table that the hardest bond to break is the carbon-fluorine bond. That requires 485 kilojoules per mole to break it. And a carbon-iodine bond is the easiest to break and that requires 240 kilojoules per mole to break it. So the harder the carbon-halogen bond is to break, the less likely nucleophilic substitution would take place because it depends on the carbon-halogen bond breaking. Now, based on bond strength, the most reactive halogen alkane would be iodoalkanes because the carbon-iodine bond breaks the easiest. Now, we have to remember that there's another factor polarity and the most polar iodoalkanes are fluoroalkanes and the least polar iodoalkanes and we'd expect iodoalkanes based on polarity not to be the most reactive but to be the least reactive halogenoalkanes so we have two competing factors bond strength indicates that iodoalkanes would be the most reactive because the carbon iodine bond breaks the easiest Polarity indicates that iodoalkanes would be the least reactive because they're the least polar. Now it's actually bond strength that determines reactivity because if we study the reactivity of halogen alkanes, we find that iodoalkanes are the most reactive and fluoroalkanes are the least reactive. So although polarity makes a difference, it's bond strength that decides the reactivity of halogen alkanes because the bond strength factor outweighs any polarity factor 
and the order of reactivity is as follows. Iodoalkanes are the most reactive, then bromo, then chloroalkanes, and then fluoroalkanes. So now let's look at some examples of nucleophilic substitution. And our first example of a nucleophilic substitution reaction is hydrolysis. This is where we swap an OH group for the halogen. And we can carry this out by heating the halogenoalkane with aqueous alkali, for example, sodium hydroxide or potassium hydroxide, and we heat it under reflux. Now we have to use aqueous alkali here because if our sodium hydroxide or potassium hydroxide was dissolved in ethanol and we heated the halogenoalkane with an alcoholic solution of sodium hydroxide or potassium hydroxide, we would get an elimination reaction taking place and an alkene forming. So if we carry out this nucleophilic substitution reaction, the OH swaps with the halogen and we get an alcohol and a halide produced. So if we look at the equation, we have chloromethane reacting with sodium hydroxide and the OH swaps with the Cl and we get methanol and sodium chloride. Now, this reaction is the first step of the silver nitrate test because the silver nitrate test is a test for a chloride ion, a bromide ion, and an iodide ion. And halogenoalkanes don't contain chloride ions, bromide ions, or iodide ions because halogenoalkanes are held together by covalent bonding. So, this first step involves you making a halide. So heating my halogenoalkane with aqueous sodium or potassium hydroxide will liberate a halide ion. It will make a chloride, bromide or iodine ion that I can test with silver nitrate. And after carrying out this first step, I would acidify my mixture because I want to make sure there's no unreacted OH- ions left over that when I add silver nitrate could form silver hydroxide and this would ruin my experiment because silver hydroxide is a white precipitate. So after adding the NaOH or KOH and heating I would then acidify my mixture and then I would test with silver nitrate to see if I had a chloride, bromide or iodide ion and that would allow me to test for a my halogenoalkane. Now you should remember that a chloride ion with silver nitrate gives a white precipitate, a bromide ion gives a cream precipitate and an iodide ion gives a yellow precipitate. So now let's test your understanding of nucleophilic substitution with some practice questions. Here's the first practice question. Read through the question, pause the video, have a go at it and then we'll go for the answers. So for this first practice question, we're asking you to complete the following word equations. So for question 1a, it was bromoethane and potassium hydroxide. So this would produce ethanol and potassium bromide. And for question b, it was chloroethane and sodium hydroxide. So that would produce ethanol and sodium chloride. And for question c, iodomethane and ammonium hydroxide would produce methanol and ammonium iodide and question 1d is chloroethane and potassium hydroxide that would produce ethanol and potassium chloride and there's one mark for each correct answer here completing these word equations. So now have a go at our second practice question so we'd like you to complete the following chemical equations so read for the question, pause the video, have a go at it, and then we'll go for the answers. So now let's go for the answers to question two. So 2A is CH3Br plus KOH, and that would produce CH3OH and KBr. And for question 2B, we have CH3, CH2, CH2, Cl plus NaOH, and that would be CH3, CH2, CH2OH, and NaCl. That's what would be produced. And for C, we have CH3, CH2I 
plus NH4OH, and that would produce CH3CH2OH plus NH4I. And then for the last one, CH3Cl plus KOH would produce CH3OH plus KCl. And there's one mark for each correct equation here. So now have a go at question three. So for question three, we're asking you to draw a reaction mechanism for the reaction of bromoethane and sodium hydroxide. And there's two marks for that. And for question 3b, we're asking you to classify this reaction mechanism for one mark. Pause the video, have a go at the question. So now let's have a look at the reaction mechanism for bromoethane reacting with sodium hydroxide. So I'm going to first draw bromoethane here. And this reaction involves an OH minus ion attacking the bromoethane molecule. And the bromoethane molecule has a delta plus carbon and a delta minus bromine. Now this dipole exists because bromine is more electronegative than carbon. And I'm going to draw in an OH minus ion and I'm going to put a lone pair of electrons on the oxygen. And this pair of electrons attacks the delta plus carbon and this causes the carbon halogen bond to break and I'm going to draw a double headed arrow from the OH minus ion to the delta plus carbon and a double headed arrow from the middle of the carbon halogen bond to the bromine atom and therefore this pair of electrons goes on to the bromine atom and forms a bromide ion. So the result of this is that the OH swaps with the Br and a nucleophilic substitution reaction has taken place. Now for this I would give one mark if you had the arrows correct here and I would give one mark for the charges. So if you had the delta plus carbon, the delta minus bromine and the Br minus ion being formed I'd give a mark for that. So now we're going to look at hydrolysis of aromatic halogenol compounds. So compounds with a benzene ring and a halogen is directly attached to the ring. Now we've just seen that we can swap a halogen atom on a halogenol alkane with an OH group. If we heat the halogenol alkane with aqueous NaOH or KOH under reflux, and if we carry out this reaction, we'll end up with an alcohol and a sodium or potassium halide. Now, refluxing aqueous NaOH is boiling this aqueous NaOH solution. And water boils at 100 degrees C. So roughly, we're heating this up to around 100 degrees C. It obviously depends on how much sodium hydroxide is present. Now... If we want to do the same reaction with an aromatic halogenol compound, we would need a much higher temperature to carry out the reaction. So for example, chlorobenzene can be reacted with aqueous NaOH to produce phenol and NaCl, but we need 300 degrees C. And to get the temperature of water up to 300 degrees C, we need very high pressure. So these different conditions suggests that the chlorobenzene here is resistant to hydrolysis. Now, what determines the reactivity of halogen alkanes is bond strength of the carbon-halogen bond. So the very fact that a aromatic halogeno compound is resistant to hydrolysis and needs a much higher temperature suggests that the carbon halogen bond is a lot stronger. Now we can prove this if we measure the bond enthalpies or the bond energies of a carbon chlorine bond in a compound such as chloroethane compared to a carbon chlorine bond in chlorobenzene because the carbon chlorine bond 
in chlorobenzene is a lot stronger. It's actually 400 kilojoules here to break the carbon chlorine bond in chlorobenzene compared to 350 in a molecule such as chloroethane. Now, if more energy is needed to break the bond, fewer the molecules will possess the higher activation energy needed for the reaction to occur. So the reason that chlorobenzene doesn't undergo nucleophilic substitution reactions in the same way as, say, molecules such as chlorophane is because the carbon-chlorine bond is a lot stronger. Now the reason that a carbon-chlorine bond is stronger in chlorobenzene compared to molecules such as chlorophane is because non-bonding pairs of electrons in p orbitals on the chlorine overlaps with the pi system of electrons on the ring. So we get this pi bonding and this makes the carbon-chlorine bond stronger. And I've drawn in the pi bonding that can take place in this diagram. Now we can use this difference in reactivity towards nucleophilic substitution as a way of distinguishing between chlorobenzene and compounds such as chloroethane. Because if we want to tell them apart, all we need to do is heat them with aqueous NaOH and the chlorobenzene would not undergo nucleophilic substitution under these normal conditions of heating under reflux. And therefore, if we then follow this up with a silver nitrate test, would not give a white precipitate. However, chloroethane would undergo nucleophilic substitution with NaOH or KOH, would produce a halide ion, and this halide ion could be tested for with silver nitrate. So that's how you could tell an aromatic halogenoalkane such as chlorobenzene from a aliphatic halogenoalkane such as chloroethane. Now our second example of a nucleophilic substitution reaction is the reaction with a cyanide compound. And this is where we swap the halogen atom for a CN group. And a cyano group is a carbon atom bonded by a triple bond to a nitrogen. So it's C triple bond N minus. And if a halogen alkane is boiled under reflux with an alcoholic solution of potassium cyanide, so for example, KCN dissolved in ethanol, a nitrile is produced. And this contains an extra carbon atom. So this reaction is a way of increasing the number of carbons in the molecule. Now the reason that the KCN has to be dissolved in alcohol is because if KCN was dissolved in water, we would produce a poisonous gas called hydrogen cyanide, which is known as nerve gas because it attacks the central nervous system. So in this reaction, the nucleophile is CN minus and a substitution reaction takes place because the CN group swaps with the halogen. Now our general equation for this reaction is KCN plus Rx and Rx represents our halogenoalkane and X represents the halogen atom and R represents an alkyl chain. And if KCN reacts with Rx, I would get RCN, my alkyl chain now with CN attached, an extra carbon atom, and KX, a potassium halide. Now, if I look at the equation in red, which is a specific example, I have KCN plus CH3CH2Br produces CH3CH2Cn plus KBr and the CN has swapped with the Br. Now the word equation here is potassium cyanide plus bromoethane produces propane nitrile and potassium bromide and the compound CH3CH2Cn that we've produced is called propane nitrile because it's got three carbons in the compound that's why it's prop and 
it's nitrile because it contains a CN. So the name of this compound is propane nitrile. So now let's test your understanding of what we've covered so far with some practice questions. So here's the first two practice questions. Read through the questions, pause the video, have a go at them, and then we'll go for the answers. So question one is asking you to complete the following chemical equations. So KCN plus C2H5Cl would produce C2H5Cn plus KCl. Now I could draw out this slightly differently. I could have written it as CH3CH2Cn instead of C2H5Cn, but it's perfectly fine to do either. And the name of this compound is propane nitrile because I've got three carbons in the chain and I've got a nitrile group. Now for B, it's KCN plus C3H7Br and that would produce C3H7Cn and KBr. And this compound would be called butane nitrile because there's four carbons in the chain and it's got a nitrile group. Now for question 1C, we have KCN reacting with C5H11Cl and that would produce C5H11Cn and KCl. And this compound would be called hexane nitrile because there's six carbons in the chain and it's got a nitrile group. Now each equation is worth one mark. So if you correctly completed each equation, you get one mark for each. Now for question two, you're asked to draw a reaction mechanism for the reaction of potassium cyanide and chloroethane. So to do this, I'm gonna draw chloroethane and I'm going to put in the delta plus on the carbon and the delta minus on the chlorine because this is a polar molecule because chlorine is more electronegative than carbon. So delta plus for the carbon, delta minus for the chlorine. Now my nucleophile is CN minus and I'm gonna put in a pair of electrons on the carbon here and these attack the delta plus carbon. So I put a double headed arrow here from the pair of electrons to the delta plus carbon. This causes the carbon chlorine bond to break. So the pair of electrons that are being shared here go on to the chlorine and this forms a chloride ion. So the result of this is that I have a compound with three carbons in and this compound contains a CN group because the CN has swapped with the CL and this compound is called propane nitrile. My other product is Cl minus. And the reaction that's taken place is a nucleophilic substitution reaction. So propane nitrile is produced from the nucleophilic substitution reaction that takes place between potassium cyanide and chloroethane. And when this takes place, I also have a halide ion that is produced. So there's two marks for this question, one mark for getting the arrows correct and one mark for getting the charges correct. So in other words, the delta plus carbon, delta minus on the chlorine and the minus charge on the CN. So here's our third practice question. So we'd like you to describe how you could use a chemical test to distinguish between compounds A and B, which are drawn here on this slide. Give the expected result for each compound and an explanation for any difference in their behavior. And this is a six mark question. Pause the video, have a go at the question, and then we'll go for the answers. So to tell these two compounds apart, you would carry out a nucleophilic substitution reaction. So if you heat both with aqueous NaOH and then add nitric acid followed by silver nitrate, you would find that compound A would give a white precipitate and compound B would not. So the idea of adding aqueous NaOH and heating gets you one mark, adding aqueous nitric acid followed by silver nitrate aqueous solution 
gets you a mark. And if you said the compound A gives a white precipitate and B does not, that gets you a mark. Now the reason for this different behaviour is that compound A undergoes nucleophilic substitution and compound B does not. So if you said compound A undergoes nucleophilic substitution, there's a mark for that. And the reason that compound B does not is because a pair of electrons in a p orbital on the chlorines overlaps with the pi electron cloud, so forming pi bonding. And this means that the carbon chlorine bond is too strong to break and therefore doesn't undergo nucleophilic substitution. So you would get a mark for talking about the delocalization of the pi electron cloud with the p orbitals on the chlorine. So this idea of pi bonding taking place, one mark for that, and one mark for the idea that the carbon chlorine bond in compound B would be too strong to break, and therefore that's why it doesn't undergo nucleophilic substitution. So here's our last practice question, question four. And the first two parts of this question are on this slide, and the last three parts of the question are on the next slide. So read through the question, pause the video, and have a go at it, and then we'll look at the next three parts of this question. So here's the last three parts of this question. So once again, read through the question, pause the video, have a go at it, and then we'll go for the answers to all five parts of question four. So now let's go for the answers to question four. So the first part of question four is asking you to explain the purpose of boiling the halogen alkane with aqueous sodium hydroxide. Now this is worth one mark, and we're looking for you to say that the reason we boil it with NaOH is to hydrolyze the bromoalkane and to release the Br- ion. Now for part two, the question is asking you to explain the purpose of acidifying with nitric acid. Now this is to prevent the silver nitrate reacting with sodium hydroxide and forming silver hydroxide, which would be a white precipitate and would ruin your test. So if you said it's to prevent the silver nitrate reacting with sodium hydroxide, or it's to mop up any unreacted sodium hydroxide and prevent the formation of silver hydroxide, you would get a mark for that. So now let's look at the last three parts of question four. So question three is asking you how you would check that the solutions had been acidified in step three of the method. Well, if you said you test the solution with either universal indicator paper or blue litmus paper, that would get you the mark. And then part four is asking you to state the color of the precipitate you would get if you use silver nitrate on a bromoalkane. So it would be a cream precipitate. And part five is asking you to state the result of the addition of conch ammonia to the suspension and the precipitate dissolves. Now you will remember the confirmation tests. Remember that a silver chloride dissolves in dilute ammonia silver bromide dissolves in concentrated ammonia and silver iodide doesn't dissolve in either dilute or concentrated ammonia. So those are the confirmation tests because it's difficult to tell the difference between white, cream and yellow precipitates. So that concludes this video lesson. So after watching this video you should be able to explain the factors that determine the reactivity of halogen alkanes and be aware that halogen alkanes undergo nucleophilic substitution reactions with hydroxide and cyanide ions. You should also be able to write chemical equations and draw reaction mechanisms to describe the nucleophilic substitution reactions and be able to name the products of forming these reactions. And finally, you should be able to explain why aromatic halogeno compounds such as chlorobenzene are resistant to undergoing nucleophilic substitution reactions. So that concludes our video. Please check out our YouTube channel, Dr. Rowe Chemistry, and our Twitter site, which contains lots of chemistry information and links, at Radar Chemistry.